Hey. How everybody doing? Are y'all ready? Y'all ready to dive into fatherhood and be a part of Stronger Than My Father podcast? What y'all saw yesterday is a small part of Marcus. Marcus is high energy, ready to go. So I want y'all to listen in, ask me some questions, ask Troy some questions, and it's going to cue my music. I'm like Dion, Jim McCarthy, play my music. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Stronger Than My Father podcast. I am your host, Marcus Benice. This podcast is designed to bring more awareness to fatherhood, and our goal for this podcast is one day make fatherhood cool again. Hey, I can't do this by myself. I have to thank my producer, Jim McCarthy, and Jim McCarthy voiceovers. If you're in, look, if you're in need of a podcast and a great podcast producer, please reach out to Jim McCarthy at jmovs.com. All right, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to introduce my guest. The moderator just did that, but Troy Smith is a great friend of mine, a mentor and a guy who really keeps me in line. Troy Smith is the author of The Mindset of Successful Thinking. And after this podcast, come to Strong My Father booth if you want to meet Troy and get his book. So welcome, Troy. Welcome to my podcast again, live. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, y'all, yeah. Come yeah, on, yeah. Y'all. yeah. We got this on video, so we'll make sure it's like a live player, yeah. Let me make sure there's some people in here because we got it on video. So I want to thank more than one person. So, and this is live, this is unscripted for Marcus. We're usually in a little small studio just recording it. So, Troy, I'm going to start this podcast. We don't have a lot of time. Don't rush it, though. It's, don't it's, rush. Okay. okay. Take your time. Those people in the audience who do not know who Troy Smith, Troy Smith grew up without a father, um, 17 children. He's going to tell you his story. And he was able to find a way to break the father's cycle. He's a father of two kids, a husband, and a great friend. He's going to tell his story how he was able to break the cycle. So, Troy, tell me a bit about yourself. Okay, well, cool. First of all, I, I, my voice sounds good, so I want to talk slow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i tell y'all what's up. Okay. Now, but uh, so as he says, 17 brothers and sisters, let's break that down. Uh, my mama's side, there's only three of us. On my dad, yeah, he said, okay. On my daddy's side, there was, so it didn't come out my mama. So my daddy's <laughs> side, there was a lot of people, okay? Uh, my, my daddy, I like to say, and, and he's my guy to this day, uh, but he was like a walking stone. He wasn't rolling. He walked. He didn't have nowhere to run to. He definitely walked. He was doing something to have all these kids. But um, I, let me tell you this story. So, so I was in college in Tennessee State. Like you said, born and raised in Knoxville, but I went to Tennessee State for my undergrad and master's there. Um, so one fall break, I went home. Is that too loud? Y'all good? We good? Okay. So one fall break, I went home and I was doing campus ministry at the time. So I was excited about going home. I've been hearing about all these Bible stories, you know, Jacob and all these people saying, you are a man, you are a father, you're, you know, you have made it you're getting knighted or something. So I went home and, uh, um, and I kick with my dad every once in a while. He's like, he became more of a friend than a father though, unfortunately, because he was not there in my life in regards to as a father should be. Um, but I didn't know him. We stayed in the same project projects at one time. He stayed on the street with his other kids and I stayed up the street with me and my brother, uh, up the street from him. So I went home and said, Hey dad, you know, well, I didn't say dad, his name is Pete. He go by Pete. He told me a long time ago, don't call me daddy no more. And I guess if you got a lot of kids saying daddy, 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 it's like, don't call me that. Just call me Pete by my name. So I said, Pete, man, do me a favor, man. Won't you, won't you pray for me? You know, make me, you know, let me know. I did a good job. Well done, son type thing. Right. And he looked me dead in my eye. And he said, unfortunately, I can't do that. He said, because I look up to you. Now, some people may be like, yeah, man, that's, I'm the daddy. <laughs> I'm the no. But I, I, at that moment, I felt so sad because he could not simply just pray for me and say, I'm proud of you. Well done, son. And at that moment, I no longer was mad at him because he wasn't around for me and my brother. It's the fact that he didn't know no better either. So if you start looking at him and then look at his daddy, he met his daddy on accident when he was 15 years old. Marcus, I'm going too far. Let me know. No, you got it. But he met his daddy when he was 15 years old, when he went to go pick him up in Memphis, Tennessee, because he didn't have a ride home back to Knoxville. I met my granddaddy on accident. I was at a, so in summer programs, uh, you know, if you're part of any, a lot of uh, 
help programs. You know, some of programs in Knoxville, you can work when you're 14 years old and um, you can start working and stuff. So I happen to go to what they call the MLB building, whatever that stands for, I don't know. And I happen to be walking in and um, this woman asked me, hey, excuse me, son, because I got a lot of aunties because I come from a, my daddy's side is a big family. She said, are you Pearl's son? I said, well, I get that a lot, but that's my auntie. I look like, I guess, her son, but that's not my my mother. No, but I am her brother's son, Pete. And I said, she said, okay, nice to meet you. I said, nice to meet you too. But then this old man that was smoking a cigarette, he was a security guard there. I said, hey, young man, you say your daddy's name was Pete? I said, yeah. Your auntie's name was Pearl? I said, yeah. I didn't say yes, sir. I said, yeah, that's all I, yeah. He said, young man, I'm your granddaddy. <clears throat> I mean, so, so that's so that at that moment I, I could not be mad anymore at him and have a grudge because he didn't know any better either. That's the time I finally knew I couldn't hold it against him. Let me ask you this: Most young men who do not have a father are angry towards a dad. Yeah. How were you not able to be mad at him? You said because he didn't have the understanding, but did you have any ill will towards him? Because he was not there in the home with you. Sadly, I didn't. Because what I learned that every young man want to know who their daddy is. I don't care what you are. Every young man, even woman, if they want to be serious about it, they want to be loved by their daddy. So that's why some people that's fatherless can, as long as you got a male figure in your life, you will go after that. And that's why I never, I, so I had football. Mm -hmm. So football, I had coaches used to come by and pick me up and be that father figure for me, even though I didn't look at them as a dad, but as a leader that actually helped me out in regards to so I'm occupied. I was occupied. I was always doing something positive where I didn't have to worry about where my daddy was at. Well, let me ask you this. When we did our last podcast, you said that some of your brothers are still mad at your father today. Yeah. How were you able to turn the curve and begin breaking the cycle? You're a father of two kids, a young daughter and young son, beautiful wife. How were you out of your 17 brothers or how many of your brothers and siblings or finding a way to break that cycle. Yeah, so I, I had a conversation with my older brother. I'm third oldest from the on the 16 side of 16, and um, and he, he was talking about the fact that he was mad at our dad. I said, "Dude, you 40 years old. You still mad at that dude? You were 40 years old, man. You got to get over it." He kept bringing up old stuff, but when it's a pain, and it's like a band aid, a scar, it's always hurts when someone brings it up again. So I told him, I said, "Look at look at this, man." He didn't know. I told him the same story I told y'all. He didn't know any better. He said, man, try to never look at it from that way. I always thought about me. Yeah. And when you become a father, though, you start learning that you, you don't have a book. There's no book. Your daddy, as cool as he is, <laughs> he still doesn't have a manual about how to be a good daddy. Mm -hmm. Even if he, because even though you had your daddy in front of you, you still have the manual that you got to create to raise your kids up. I just do what my daddy tell me. Yeah. I know. <laughs> That's why Marcus. <laughs> My daddy and my mama here in the audience, my dad, my mom, I forgot to introduce him at the beginning. He was the one I told you about in the stories yesterday morning about if you didn't go to church, he'd be waiting for you in the garage to cut grass and work, work you hard again. So uh, if you come to the 3.30 class today, you'll see my father and my mom there. But back to you in your book, you wrote about developing the mindset to be successful. I know you're a motivated speaker and you go out. How did you change your mindset now? Since you say there's no blueprint on the father, how are you changing your mindset? And what can you tell the audience from what you wrote in your book to develop you to become a good dad? Well, okay, I'm going to ask y'all this question. Who, who are, raise your hand if you had a father in your household. That's a lot of black folk with daddies in the house. That's nice. <laughs> but everybody else, too, now raise your hand if you did not. All right, then. Let me ask you, one, some, one person, I'm going to give you a free book if you answer this for me. What was the one thing you wanted to make sure you did best since your daddy wasn't there? Just anybody, throw it out. Huh? Be a good daddy. What about somebody else? Never lie to your children. That's a good, never lie to your children. <laughs> what about the, even the Clint Santa Claus? That's another one. What about somebody else? Go ahead. Uh-huh. One more, go ahead. Huh? Be there for your children. I tell you this, I wanted to take care of mama. I want to make sure I take care of my mama. And then just remind me when we get down, you said you're going to give me a free book. I'll give you one. I ain't going to lie to you. <laughs> but I want to make sure I take care of my mama. So my mindset had to shift. I can't keep being mad at this guy who didn't know any better if I want to take care of my mama. I need to make sure I get. So when I grew up in the project, so I grew up in the project. There were 10 projects in Knoxville. I probably lived in eight of them. All right. So and now I can't go back and say this is where your daddy came from because they tore down. <laughs> but. um. 
I come out look at my kids, take them down. They're like, this is a nice house. This is a million dollar house. <laughs> you, you from this? You said you're from the hood. But, um, take care of mama. I say, I either going to be an athlete or I'm either going to be a rapper. Because all I knew at that time was to be an entertainer or to play sports. But my mom always told us to go to school. Because my mom dropped that when she was in the ninth grade. She had me she was 15 years old. So by the time my dad was 19, he had three kids. My mom, by the time she was 22, she had three to four kids. Well, we had a fourth one, but he passed away at birth, though. But she had four kids. So in order for me to do well, I can't keep worried about somebody else and what they're doing if I want to do, be great and successful myself. So it's always been a mindset that me. And I got, dang it, I've been born to be a daddy. Uh oh I know. I'm born to be a father, man. I've never heard somebody say, I'm born to be a father. I am, because I always told myself, I said, man, I'm not going to do what my daddy done. But guess what? I went to a men's conference this past weekend. And I learned that no matter what race you're a part of, a lot of people still want a daddy. I've, I heard, it was a multitude of, I mean, there's a lot of white guys in there, like 2,000 some odd people, and a sprinkle of us black people in there too. But the fact is, is that I heard them say, the speakers say, he had a dad who grew up with him in his household, but he wasn't there. So while I'm up for fighting to have a daddy in the house, he didn't know what a man was, and his daddy was right there in his face. So I learned that regardless of what nationality you're part of, a father is always important to lay that foundation because we have a responsibility, if you don't know if you're a god believing person or not, uh, is that we lay the foundation. Let me ask you this. In your book, you wrote a chapter called Allow Yourself to Make Mistakes. Yeah. We as fathers, we make mistakes at times, but there are some fathers who are not in their kids' lives, feel like they made mistakes and they can't get back to their kids. What would you tell that father that's listening today about allowing yourself to make mistakes? Yeah, so I learned from my daddy now at 40, 40 years old. He just turned 59. So my, my parents are young. And he said, you know what, Troy? I can't let old stuff keep hindering and holding me down. If you're going to keep holding it against me, not me, he just said in general. I said, how do you deal with the fact that people talking bad about you? He said, I can't, if they're going to keep doing that, don't be around me. I can't, I can't change the past. All I can deal with today. And I got to move forward with today. So if you, regardless of what happened yesterday, regardless of what you did years ago, you didn't go to the graduation, you didn't go to the birthday party, you can be there today. Well, if we, Does that make sense? Yes Last or no? Question. I got to say yes, though. <laughs> Last question before we go into Q&A. You wrote a question about strategic life planning. Stop. The one I highlight the most was stop thinking too much. Mm. Do you think dads think too much about being a good father or is it just something natural? Because I think about it all the time because I'm trying to live up. And I know my dad going to kill me for this. I'm trying to live up to him. And he told me, son, you can't be like me. And I'm saying, daddy, I only know one person to be like, and that's you. But he said, you have to live your own life. So I'm trying to, and I know you're going to keep me, I'm trying to be like him, uh, how I raise my sons. I have two sons that's 14 and eight. But every time they come around mom and dad, they better look presentable. They better not look like my mom used to say the word heathens. Don't look like heathens. I hope you don't kill me for that. But you learn into my life as a father. And so, Troy, why do you think, I think a lot. So he, if you listen to our podcast, he did give me a therapy session on trying to be I'm about dad. to tell you something right now, but I'm going to hold back. No, go ahead and tell them because they're going to listen to the podcast. I almost wanted to choke them because I'm like, you can't tell me how not to be a daddy. When that man trained me how to be a daddy, he was like, you thinking too much. You think too much because I'm thinking every move. But the biggest thing of my issue is I'm trying to protect my son at 14. And he, he has five years, four years. He has to get ready for this big world. But daddy still wants to protect him. This man tells me you can't do that. And I'm like, there's no way you can tell me what I can't do. Mm -hmm. So tell them about me not thinking too much as a father. Hey, so what is uh, one thing your mom used to tell you or if she didn't like your daddy? You just like your daddy. So you, you just like your mom. Say that about me then. I'm just like my daddy. But, but, just okay. like it, but what's your daddy, by me knowing him a little bit, just by <laughs> one thing he going to say is, truthfully, be better than me. If you're doing the right thing, you're going to be better than your daddy was. Stronger than your daddy. Yeah. And what I say by watching what you say, it's, it's careful. You got to be careful what you say and speak over yourself and over your life and with your kids. I mean, you're telling somebody you're going to be just like your daddy and you know it's trifling. Guess what they're going to end up being? Trifling. Dirty, stank, everything else in between there. But if you're speaking life over somebody, speaking life over these people and your kids, then you're doing good.
<laughs> is that the is that the Q? Yeah, we gotta get rid of Q and A. Does that make sense, y'all? Y'all made me feel made me feel good. I'm up here, golly. But one thing, please buy his book. It really helped my life. Oh, please buy the book. <laughs> and, and he put me on blast in my body. He said, "You didn't read my whole book yet." I was like, "Man, I'm trying to get to it." That's it. How are you going to interview me? You read my whole book. <laughs> this is this is two bathroom breaks. <laughs> <laughs> two bathroom breaks. Your leg done got numb. <laughs> you can keep going to the next page because you'll be done. Two bathroom breaks. You'll be ready to go. So Troy, Troy is a great motivator, great mentor of mine, a uh, great speaker. Let me run a and a real quick because my time is up and I have to be mindful of the time for the next people to come on the stage. If you have a quick question for Troy or myself, please raise your hand. The moderator's out there with a the mic. Ask us some quick questions about fatherhood. Let's get us started real quick. Anybody? Real quick. Have is a that quick question. Are you raising your hand for oh, you raise your hand? I'm sorry. I thought you was the moderator with the mic. My bad. Real loud, please. You got just come closer. I ain't going to bite you. <laughs> He will. Oh, well, yeah, go ahead. So my name is Sherry Hyatt. I'm the director for Family Services in North Alabama. Uh, we are, we have two programs. One is Victim Services and Prevention, where we serve victims of rape and human trafficking. We also have Workforce Development Education, where we pay for uh, parents to, to get jobs. We can pay for education. We can do parenting classes, et cetera, et cetera. We have in our agency um, what we call the Cultural Connection Committee, where we meet on a quarterly basis with all eight counties that we serve, uh, big, uh, people from marginalized populations, whether it's LGBTQ, Black, Haitian, we have a huge Haitian population there, um, uh, faith-based, uh, intellectually challenged, so on and so forth. So my question to you is, Unfortunately, the male population is what we would consider one of the marginalized populations. And when it comes to mental health, when it comes to victimization in the male community, obviously we all know that men are not gonna speak up as often about being victims. How can we as an agency reach the male population, some of which are fathers? How can we reach them better? to let them know like we're here, that we wanna help because we know we've experienced a lot of the male population who are fathers who do not speak up. It prevents them from being the fathers that they can be, the potential, it kind of stifles that. So we want to change that. Mm -hmm. How can we do that better? You go ahead, Troy. Uh, look, he tried to throw it on me. Yeah, you go ahead. You guess. That's a long question, so I'm trying to remember, make sure I remember all of it. But I tell you this one, the best thing is having an example there. Do you have any men that serve with you all now? Justin, where you at? Raise your hand, Justin. There you go, Justin. Yeah, you go, Justin. Justin, Justin. Are you the only one, though? Are you the only one? Are you the only one that served with this community as a male? Okay, one more. So we need two, three, four more. Okay. But good, but the main thing is having him around to set the example, because this is the thing about since it's such a small number of men wanting to be involved. Do y'all know why so many women help and serve community or nonprofits besides they work from home or not? Can someone tell me why? Uh, it doesn't pay. <laughs> that could be one. Nonprofit, but the thing is because women can actually see a vision quicker than a guy can. Whoa, I didn't know that. Because a woman is a nurturer, right? Mm -hmm. They help grow children. They, I mean, they can nurture things. Men want to see it today. Show me something now. <laughs> like, okay, you tell me I can do X, Y, Z. I remember I told my brother to stop selling drugs. He said, okay, Ben, but who's going to replace what I don't make? Well, they didn't think of that part, but dang. Well, uh, get a job. <laughs> they don't make as much money as I make now. So if you have more male figures that's actually there as an example to see, and then that'll give the guy an example to show. And then also there for longevity. See, a lot of times African-American men can't be there a lot because we got other responsibilities. So it's a small number. So we get pulled left and right. Be on this board, be on that board, be on that committee, help Marcus out, all the other stuff. I, I don't have the time in the day to do that. And oftentimes women can do that more. And all the time other denomin uh, uh, denominations, but other nationalities can do that more because they have more resources to do so. Uh, but I would say having more men around just to be an example we help out the young men that's there because they can see somebody. Am I making sense? Thank you so much. One more question, and then we got to wrap it up. One more. Golly, that's I got okay. respect for the time. He said be off stage at 2 o'clock. Man, we ain't worried about that. Okay. Are we how many minutes? We got five minutes. Okay, cool. All right. 
um, the scripture you was talking about is Proverbs 18. My name is James the Salvation Army. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life lays in the power of the tongue, and what you speak is the fruit thereof. We as men need to learn how to speak life into some situation, the circumstance. Question is, back in the day, they used to have manpower with Tony Evans. Do you think yeah. that this might be a movement that we can start collaborating and coming together to establish more of a manpower like they used to do back in the day? Yeah, I agree. I think we need to have more men conferences, more movements, um, and this also adds to spiritual component as well. We need that. It's a lot of kids in the community. Gangs are huge. How do they get all these kids? But men, sometimes it's hard for us to come together. But I think we need to have a movement to show more men what a father looks like. I still call it the silent pandemic that no one talks about. But I think we need to have that movement. And so I think we need to keep pushing and keep pushing. And I commend Commissioner Carter and 18 for putting this conference on. It's bringing awareness. We don't have no news media here. Why the news ain't here taking a picture of this? Why, did, why Channel 4 and 5 ain't here? And I don't care if they like me or not. <laughs> The point is, is that they always show bad crime on TV. When do they show good stuff? You get them riled up. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. I'm serious. I'm serious. We had a tie ceremony. I call all the news media. They ain't show up. And Chief Drake, our chief, was here. But let me say Chief Drake was being held up. Everybody would have been there. So that's why I go against the news sometimes. I'm cool, man. I'm cool. I told you, I, I told you I got the wheels burning. We got to go. But no, I we think don't. We, we have to have more what you're doing. I'd be happy to talk to you about it because I want to keep this movement going to do more for fathers and encourage them. And the biggest thing is a legal legacy for their children. Leave something in him. That man right there is left enough. If he died tomorrow, which I hope doesn't happen, he left enough in me to be a man, be a father, and take care of my family. But he did, but to add on top of that, yes, there is a movement that's happening today because men or people don't know what a male, biological male is. No matter if they got something between the legs or not, you don't know <laughs> because they haven't had an example and you've been sit to the side to be put back in the back. You too mean, you too hard, but it's going to come with some love. So we got to come with more love, as P. Diddy would say, more love, you know, more <laughs> love and actually show some more love to show that people, hey, we're here to love on you as a father. One more question. Go ahead. I'm David. I'm a youth counselor and a youth pastor. I mean, from yesterday. Yeah. Uh, I talked to you yesterday about, yes, sir. you know, getting something started in these community, communities that does not have any programs like that for the youth. But also, the question is, what impact did the coaches, like the football coaches, the mentors, uh, the programs that, that were for the children, for the kids, the boys that didn't have daddies, what impact did that have on your life? Exposure. Because I didn't have any exposure at first. So they actually came and picked me up from where I was at and took me out the environment. So I, I went, I come out the project, took me down, if you're from Knoxville, down west. Down west is more a suburban area. Uh, the exposure, being able to see different things that I wasn't used to seeing. I, the first time I went out of, out of Tennessee, when I was 18 years old because a mentor took me to meet him took me out of town to where he's from in Georgia. Heard about on the rap songs, never been there. So, uh, exposure. One more, and then I'm done. I'm watching Lee in the back. Yeah, that's my, that's my new guy right here, man. <laughs> Mr. Penny. Mr. Penny, what you got for me? Well, after that long walk from lunch, I'm just going to Your colleague here uh, said, if there was crime here, there would be reporters. Yeah, so. Maybe 25 years ago, they had in Washington, D.C., a million man march. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be a plausible idea to have a million man marked? For fatherhood, there's an organization that's doing it. A marked, like merchandise mark, a million men who are entrepreneurs meeting up, selling goods and services, and fellowshipping. Could that be a catalyst? I think you have to have somebody, I mean, you, you have to have somebody strong that can do that. I think it's, I think it's needed um, to see positive. Young, if young men can look at Instagram and all these other things and see negative, why can't we have a move where they see positive young men? 
positive executive people, positive people in a, in a good light. It needs to be more of an awareness to that and not let kids continue to see bad things. So I think there needs to be a movement. Um, my wife was telling me the other day, why don't we do a fatherhood walk so we can parade that fatherhood matters? Um, I did it in the projects a couple of years ago. I did a fatherhood march through the projects here. And uh, I didn't tell my mother, and she saw it on television. She was like, why were you doing that? And I said, God told me to do it. And there was a shooting while they was over there. So I had to hit the ground. But I took the leap of faith to go do a march to let people know in the project that fatherhood matters and that fathers need to step up. So I think we need to. I just think you need somebody who can be a good catalyst to do it. So um, we got to wrap it up. Whoa. Last thing, last thing. Okay. I want y'all, I want y'all, I want to leave y'all with this. Consistency. Every time we do conferences or go to a family reunion, or go where we always say, oh, we got to get together, we got to do this again, we got to do this more often. You go, you go home from something like this and go hug your kids and love on them, but then the next day you don't do it again. So it's important that we do consi be consistent in what we're doing if we're going to do any projects, programs, or whatever. Thank y'all. Well, thank y'all for listening. He played my intro to close us out. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Strong in My Father podcast live. If you like what you hear, please click the subscribe button on our YouTube page and share the word that there's a podcast so it's bringing more awareness to fatherhood. I cannot leave this podcast without thanking a few more people. Commissioner Carter, thank you so much for this platform. Um, Leah, who's in the back, thank you for this platform. My wife, who's here. Um, Y'all see in the back with the purple jacket. Strong in my father, program director and event operation, Ms. Renee Jones, who's on the phone, and my board member, Chairman Tony Honeycutt, who's here from Strong in my father. So thank y'all for listening. Please subscribe. Please meet us at a booth. Let's Two make bathroom breaks. Strong. Two bathroom breaks. Buy his book, The Success Successful Mindset. 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 He's going to create the mindset, successful thinking. God bless you all. Thank you for listening to the Strong in my father podcast. Mm -hmm.